Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in a few minutes. We have a problem with John Holdren's slides, which he are, is down in the speaker ready room, working on that right now. So we're just uh, improvising whether to swap his talk with Kelly and maybe have Kelly go first. Um, so just give us a few more minutes. And I also want to acknowledge that there are people through uh, AGU Go who are online watching this session, and we have a student in the back who's going to be also acknowledging questions uh, from the people who are online. So if you'll just uh, give us uh, the, information. the information if you want. I guess uh, you can also sit in the room and provide questions to that system, and, and, uh, but we will have traditional questions at the end um, of each talk. So. So I think we'll just go ahead and move forward, and we're going to assume that John's slides will not be a problem in a few minutes. So today we're here to celebrate um, uh, not only the fact that AGU is turning 100 years old, but it, we have some other birthdays to celebrate. And that is that the SCAR, the Scientific uh, Council on, um, for Antarctic Research, has also turned 60 years old, and the Polar Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences has also turned 60 years old. Both of these uh, units were started in 1958, and we're thrilled to then present you with a series of uh, papers today that kind of look not only at, uh, at the past 60 years, but also, more importantly, look forward uh, to the directions that we're, that we're headed. So we'll start this morning. We have a uh, lineup of speakers here that you see, and again, just to uh, uh, because of some uh, issue with slides, we're going to have Kelly Faulkner go first, and with the hope that John is back in the room here shortly. So I'm, I apologize if, uh, if you came particularly for his talk at this moment, and, um, and then we'll hopefully get right back on schedule. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce Kelly. Um, Kelly is the director of the Office of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation. Uh, of course, the Office of Polar Programs supports Arctic and Antarctic research through grants, uh, researchers around the world. And uh, prior to coming to NSF in 2011, she was a professor at the Oregon State University's College of Earth, Oceanic, and Atmospheric Sciences. Kelly Faulkner. Thank you, Julie. So I'm delighted to be here for the 60th birthday of the Polar Research Board. And um, I'm sure John is going to talk quite a bit about the International Geophysical Year, so I'll touch on that only briefly. Involvement of the National Science Foundation in polar science began just a few short years after its creation when NSF was drawn by the academies into planning and support of the U.S. science program for the 1957-58 International Geophysical Year. So the IGY, with its strong polar focus, just about doubled the young agency's budget at that time. Polar science has long been a vital part of the NSF portfolio. Okay. All right, good. Uh, so we do owe a great deal of debt to the early pioneers of polar science. So on the left, up there, you're looking at the first overwintering team at South Pole Station consisting of 18 men under the joint leadership of civilian Paul Seipel and Lieutenant John Tuck. Supported primarily by airdrops, a Navy construction battalion erected the first South Pole Station. Any of you who have been to Pole can appreciate just how difficult it was, let alone to overwinter and undertake science with absolutely no infrastructure to start with. So on the right is Admiral Dufek, overall in charge of the Antarctic IGY program, pictured with Sir Edmund Hillary of New Zealand. As a result of their interchange, New Zealand became our neighbor on Ross Island. So scientific accomplishments of the IGY were spectacular, ranging from radically new estimates of the Earth's total ice volume to improved meteorology and seismology of the Southern Hemisphere to the beginnings of space science via rockets and the first satellites Cosmic ray recorders, spectroscopes, and radio sound balloons opened up the upper polar atmosphere to exploration. It was a really exciting time for discovery. However, 
The rules of participation were governed by the U.S. Navy norms. In 1956, Admiral Dufek said that women would join American teams in the Antarctic over his dead body. <laughs> he was not alone in believing that women's presence would, quote, wreck men's illusions of being heroes and frontiersmen. <laughs> Military groups were also worried about inadequate sanitation facilities and sexual misconduct. Fortunately, times change, and this season marks another 60th anniversary, that of the first women to set foot at pole. And that's what you're looking at in that picture on the right. By the time of the international pole year of 2007 and 8, women became well established in polar science and science support. So fast forward to today, and I'm happy to report that women have served with distinction in nearly every capacity in both the Arctic and Antarctic programs. So in the upper right is Katie House, who in recent years broke long-held stereotypes by successfully serving as the heavy equipment mechanic for the South Pole Traverse. So women participate in polar science, science support, and leadership throughout the world. Despite that progress, the polar research community remains a long way from being as diverse as the society that supports us. And that brings me to my first take home message. For polar research to benefit from the best and brightest ideas and continued support, we must make real progress to entrain diversity and promote a truly inclusive community. And this will have to be an all hands on deck effort to make a real difference. In addition to the workforce, the quality and pace of polar science relies heavily on critical infrastructure and technology. So while this is true for both poles, I'll use an Antarctic example. McMurdo Station, the major US logistics hub, was set up in expeditionary fashion in 1955-56. In the 62 years since, many outstanding science achievements have been supported at and via McMurdo and other permanent and temporary facilities, both north and south. I snapped this view of our station just a week ago. So there are over 100 structures spread out over a very broad campus. Forklifts and trucks are constantly transiting between 19 different warehouses and seemingly countless outdoor storage berms. The 2012 Blue Ribbon Panel headed by Norma Augustine, rightfully pointed out inefficiencies. Sustaining them ultimately comes at the expense of science. Now, NSF seeks and takes advice about all of our polar facilities seriously. The need to become more efficient, cost-effective, and smarter is ongoing. Final National Science Board approval of the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science, or AIMS, project is targeted for this coming February. This picture shows an architect's rendition of the new McMurdo Core facility. Imagine just three warehouses co-located with activities, better skin-to-volume ratios that save energy, and most materials stored inside you're gonna get flexible and streamlined support of science for the next 35 to 50 years. So also pictured up above is an ice tethered profiler to remind us that innovation in autonomous sensing is greatly changing our understanding of the polar environment. NSF put into play a new state-of-the-art polar capable research vessel, Sekuliak, run by the University of Alaska, also pictured. That traverse equipment that Katie House helped to keep running currently delivers 75% of the fuel needed by the very modern South Pole Station pictured on the right. That alone replaced over 90 LC-130 flights, freeing them up for deep field research support, such as the Thwaites project that I'll return to in a minute. Okay, so by supporting great people, as well as advancing infrastructure and technology, the U.S. has achieved world-leading polar science. I won't attempt to enumerate the many important discoveries of which we can all be very proud, and I'm sure my fellow panelists will touch on impressive examples. By nearly every measure, U.S. polar scientists are among the most productive in the world. The U.S. has always and still solidly leads in number and quality of peer-reviewed scientific publications. 
No doubt NSF will continue to invest and help to coordinate interagency and international partners to optimize polar research outcomes for years to come. The world is rapidly recognizing the value of polar research. NSF foresees ever more integration of polar research with science objectives elsewhere on and from our planet. So I'd like to conclude with current examples of exciting NSF-supported science that emerged as community priorities. We heard you and overcame a number of obstacles to commit to all of these projects. So on the left, two papers were published in July that described the detection of extremely high energy neutrinos at the ice cube detector at South Pole Station. Extremely high is like 50 times more than we can uh, achieve with a Super Hadron Collider. Corroborative electromagnetic observations by other facilities around the world and in space helped to identify a blazar as a first ever confirmed source of cosmic rays and so provided a first answer to an over 106 year old mystery. In the middle, an autonomous float is being launched for the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling or SOCOM program. And these state-of-the-art robots have generated first ever year-round coverage of physical and chemical properties of the Southern Ocean that demonstrate that the system is a whole lot more dynamic than had been assumed. And the results are really triggering a reevaluation of the role of the Southern Ocean in global climate. And pictured on the right is the Thwaites Glacier, which is currently the fastest moving glacier in Antarctica. It is holding back an ice sheet that sits below sea level. If it melts back to the grounding line, the equivalent of at least three meters of global sea level rise is at stake. The National Academy study that we commissioned to help identify priority science investment areas during the Ames construction period identified Thwaites research as a top priority for this reason. Thus, NSF joined forces for a $25 million joint US and UK expedition that will poke and prod every aspect of the glacier and its environment. It's the climate science equivalent of a new Mars rover mission. The five-year effort will use tools ranging from radar devices dragged across the ice to image the glacier's interior, to autonomous underwater vehicles, to sensors attached to elephant seals. We are, of course, equally excited by many other projects that we sponsor north and south. An initiative we call Navigating the New Arctic, or NNA for short, is among NSF's top 10 priority strategic investment areas. We have just released a dedicated solicitation for $30 million in new funds for NNA. It targets science at the intersection of human, natural, and built environments. We expect this to be the first of five or more years of investments to accelerate research and help inform much needed decision making in the face of major Arctic change. We're excited about it and we hope you are as well. So as we look to the next 60 years, NSF will, number one, nurture and heed an ever more diverse polar research and research support community. Number two, strive toward more effective infrastructure. Three, drive innovation and technology, including on the data side of the house, critically important, and productively partner with others. And all of this to keep US polar researchers at the forefront of promoting the progress of science. So I think with that, John will probably tell us a whole lot more about how we partner well with others. So thank you very much. Can we have time for a question? Kelly needs to get off to another event, so we'd like to take advantage of her being here. So are there any questions? And please wave your hand because the lights are quite bright up here. Questions? OK. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We're, we uh, have Dr. Holdren back in the room, and we have the slides set up, and so I'd like to uh, uh, again, welcome everyone to our special session on the 60 years of scientific achievements in the Arctic and Antarctic, looking back but looking forward. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my co-convener up here, Jim White. Uh, he was a former uh, chair of the Polar Research Board, and I'm, and I'm Julie Brigham-Gretti, the current chair of the Polar Research Board. 
It is my great honor to introduce Dr. John Holden. He is the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy at the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, co-director of the school's Science, Technology, and Policy program, professor of the Environmental Science and Policy in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, and faculty affiliate in the Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Science. From January 2009 to January 2017, he was President Obama's science advisor and Senate confirmed director of the White House Science Office of Science and Technology. He was elected also to the National Academy of Sciences, and I have to say, we miss you. <laughs> Dr. Holden. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here. I'm sorry to be a few minutes late. I had a few emergencies in the last uh, 12 hours, but, uh, but here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of aspects of international collaboration on Arctic science. They're listed here. Could we turn this a little yes. bit this way so I can see this more easily. So uh, you can read faster than I can talk, and I only have 15 minutes, so I won't read this to you, but I'm going to cover, obviously, uh, a lot of ground. Starting with the drivers of international collaboration, why we collaborate in Arctic science. Uh, first of all, there are eight nations that have territory or territorial waters uh, in the Arctic. The marine and terrestrial Arctic ecosystems sprawl across and link those national territories. The ecosystems don't respect national political boundaries. Uh, many more nations than the eight Arctic nations have interests, uh, certainly potentially and many actual, in the part of the Arctic Ocean that is outside territorial waters. Conditions in the Arctic, uh, as we'll see in more detail, affect climate and weather across the Northern Hemisphere and sea level globally. And sharing national capabilities for costs of and data from research is especially helpful in circumstances where the challenges and the costs of research are high in relation to the national resources available for that research. That's true in space, it's true of fusion energy, it's true in particle physics, and it is true in the Arctic. A lot of different forms of international collaboration from the informal to the very formal, starting with informal pre-publication sharing of data, metadata, and analyses. Uh, lots of investigator to investigator arrangements to collaborate on research and publication. There are many institution to institution research collaborations across national boundaries. There are bilateral government to government engagement and agreements on access, on data sharing, on joint research. And there are multilateral engagement and agreements among governments. I'm going to focus in this talk uh, on the last of these, the multilateral uh, engagement and agreements among governments. Starting with the early history of intergovernmental collaboration on Arctic science, it actually began in the 19th century, uh, initiated by a Prussian military officer in 1875. He didn't live to see the actual implementation of the first international polar year in 82 and 80, 1882 and 1883. There were 12 uh, Arctic uh, and two sub-Antarctic research stations operated by 12 participating nations at the time, uh, and they made observations on all the topics uh, indicated here. Uh, the second international polar year took place 50 years later, 50th anniversary of the first one in 1932 and three. Uh, 44 countries participated, up from 12 the first time. Uh, and in that effort, uh, advances were mobilized uh, that had taken place in meteorology, magnetism, atmospheric science, uh, and the mapping of ionospheric phenomena. Uh, there were 27 observation stations established uh, for that second uh, inter international polar year, a uh, huge amount of data uh, collected, uh, a world data center uh, was created under the organization that eventually came to be called the World Meteorological Organization. The third international polar year took place in 57 and 58. It was held in conjunction with the International Geophysical Year 
at that time. Uh, 67 countries participated. Uh, many, many achievements, which I won't detail here, but one very important one was mapping uh, the seabed of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the work of the third intergovernmental uh, international polar year uh, led to the Antarctic Treaty, because of course the Antarctic was part of the polar focus, as it had been earlier. Uh, and it led to the establishment of the International Council of Scientific Unions World Data System, compiling and making available uh, data from many different countries uh, on uh, polar issues. Oops, I got out of pace here. Okay, so let me uh, turn to the added urgency and complexity of Arctic science that has been imposed by rapid uh, climate change in the Arctic. Uh, a feature of global climate change, but happening much faster. As noted here, the average annual surface air temperature in the Arctic, as I think everyone in this room knows, has been increasing two to three times faster than the global average. Uh, Arctic Ocean sea ice and thickness has been shrinking rapidly with all kinds of consequences. Uh, some new opportunities, but even with the new opportunities, uh, new navigation routes, ocean resource exploitation opportunities, there are new accompanying challenges in monitoring and management. Uh, a big issue in increased storm damage and coastal erosion, uh, afflicting coastal communities and infrastructure because there's more open water. The retreat of the sea ice has given the wind a uh, big fetch over open ocean, bigger waves, uh, and of course has exposed the shoreline that was previously protected by sea ice running right up to the shore. Uh, impacts on sea ice dependent organisms throughout the Arctic Ocean food webs, seals, walruses, polar bears, uh, many others. Uh, and impacts on the Arctic energy balance and the changes that the Arctic energy balance imposes on northern hemisphere weather and climate. A uh, big expansion of the area burned by wildfires. Interesting in the United States, nine of the 10 largest wildfires in US history in terms of area burned took place since uh, the year 2000 and half of those were in Alaska. Uh, the consequences, of course, include uh, risk to communities and infrastructure, loss of valuable timber, additions of greenhouse gases, both from the burning and the exposure of soil to increase microbial action uh, and smoke pollution. Uh, thawing permafrost, another big issue, subsidence damages to buildings, roads, other infrastructure, exposure of previously frozen organic carbon to bacterial action releasing either CO2 or methane, depending on whether that bacterial action is aerobic or anaerobic, and shrinking glaciers and shrinking Greenland ice sheet, freshening the Arctic Ocean and contributing to global sea level rise. So a big panoply of complications, of growing challenges uh, on the overlay of what is already um, very challenging Arctic science, what was already very challenging Arctic science. The future impacts of Arctic climate change uh, summer temperatures under business as usual in the last part of the current century will average six to eight degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial Arctic temperatures. Sea ice could disappear altogether as early as 2040 and no later than 2100. Alaska wildfires already burning twice the area they did 50 years ago are likely to double that area again by 2050. Similar growth in area burned expected across the Arctic. Permafrost thawing will become widespread, major impacts on communities, infrastructure, increased releases of carbon dioxide, methane, and even mercury. There's a huge amount of mercury in, uh, stored in permafrost, oddly enough. Uh, and of course, the loss of ice from glaciers and Greenland will accelerate, making even bigger contributions to global sea level rise. So what are the biggest climate-related Arctic science challenges? This one's a little out of order, so I'm just gonna get it all up there. Uh, and as I note here, and I've said before, the science of geophysical and ecosystem processes in the Arctic would be challenging even without climate change. And that's because, as you all know, of the extreme conditions, the difficult access, the sparse monitoring, and of course, the complexity of those uh, marine and terrestrial systems in the Arctic. So rapid climate change had added, has added a number of things. Urgent needs to understand the dynamics of the loss of Arctic sea ice and land ice, which we still do not fully understand, uh, in order to enable improved projections uh, under alternative future trajectories. Uh, we need to better understand the evolving dynamics of Arctic Ocean ecosystems under the multiple stresses of sea ice loss, freshening, warming, acidification, changes in currents. 
We need to better understand the processes governing future releases of carbon dioxide, methane, and mercury, both from land and from shallow ocean sediments under warming and permafrost thaw. Uh, we need to understand the dynamics through which Arctic warming and sea ice and snow cover loss are interacting with mid-latitude processes to affect northern hemisphere atmospheric and ocean circulation. All of those challenges are going to require big improvements in monitoring, the diversity of variables tracked, the spatial and temporal density of the measurements, and also will require <clears throat> improvements in databases and big data analytics. <clears throat> in addition, I'm going to find some water here. Here's one. Thank you. In addition, understanding the interaction of rapid Arctic change with Arctic communities and institutions is going to require much greater engagement of social scientists in Arctic issues. And finally, indigenous and local knowledge will need to be better integrated with modern science to fully understand what's going on in the Arctic, what will happen, and what we can do. A response of the Arctic science community post-1990, of course, the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1988 and the release of the first assessment of the IPCC in 1990, both solidified and propagated understanding of the imminence of major climate change impacts both globally and in the Arctic. Uh, in 1990, the International Arctic Science Committee was established as a non-governmental organization by science organizations in all eight Arctic nations. Uh, and today, Arctic science organizations in 23 nations are members of that committee. Also in 1990, the International Arctic Social Sciences Organization was founded, uh, aiming at promoting greater engagement of social scientists very appropriately, as I've noted, in Arctic issues. Uh, the fourth international polar year, the fourth uh, in that sequence that began in the 1880s, uh, took place in 2007 and 2008, by far the largest ever. Uh, 50,000 researchers, 228 projects, uh, observations, research analysis, uh, very coordinated field campaign. Uh, and I turn next to expanding the U.S. government engagement uh, under President Obama. And I'll say a few words about this that aren't on slides. Uh, in the Obama administration, starting in 2009, there were major reassessments of U.S. strategy in the Arctic, uh, not just about science, but about navigation, sovereignty, conservation, resource exploitation, and more. But in all of those assessments, in 2009, in 2013, uh, and subsequently, uh, increasing emphasis on scientific research was a major feature, and so was emphasis on increased international collaboration on scientific research in the Arctic. In January of 2015, President Obama signed an executive order uh, creating something called the Arctic Executive Steering Committee with responsibility for coordinating priorities and uh, coordinating the implementation of policies uh, among the 25 departments, agencies, and offices in the federal government that have Arctic responsibilities. And the executive order, uh, in a way, unfortunately for me, named me as the chair of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee with the responsibility of herding 25 tigers, the senior representatives of those departments, agencies, and offices. And again, on the agenda of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, improving uh, and upgrading the effort on Arctic science research and increasing international collaboration in Arctic science research uh, was a major uh, feature. I'm going to just, in the remaining time, cover uh, a couple of uh, issues that fell under that effort. Uh, one was the U.S. role in the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council uh, was established in 1996 by the eight Arctic nations as a governmental entity. The representatives are the foreign ministers, in our case, the Secretary of State of the eight nations. Uh, involvement of uh, six organizations of Arctic indigenous communities focuses on sustainable development, environmental protection, shipping, and research, very importantly. Um, mentioned that. The chairmanship rotates among the eight member states for two-year terms. 
Uh, the United States was in the chair from 2015 to 2017, and again, made research and international cooperation in research a major theme of the U.S. chairmanship in uh, the Arctic Council. Uh, there are standing working groups on all the topics indicated here, including uh, monitoring and assessment. Um, that's a repeat. Uh, a little bit about the Arctic Council uh, mandate. Again, I didn't quite get to uh, sorting these slides at the end uh, as rigorously as I would have preferred. Uh, but a number of assessments have been issued based on international scientific cooperation in which the uh, Arctic nations have been engaged. And there have been three major agreements adopted by the Arctic Council. Uh, you see them listed here. The third one, the most recently concluded, May 2017, uh, in Fairbanks, uh, International Cooperation on Scientific Research. And it has uh, a number of elements uh, listed here. Again, you can read faster than I can talk, so I'll let you read them. Uh, and the last one, particularly important, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, uh, chaired by Fran Ulmer, the former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska and former Chancellor of the University of Alaska in Anchorage, uh, is the competent authority uh, under the Arctic Science Agreement representing the United States, a U.S. Uh, point of contact uh, in that Arctic Science Agreement. Uh, President Obama uh, hosted, uh, along with Secretary Kerry for the first time, an international conference on Arctic issues centered around climate change impacts uh, in the Arctic and made uh, a number of commitments, including improvements in scientific monitoring and observing new climate data and tools and enhancing international collaboration. Uh, the foreign ministers or their representatives from 22 countries were present at that meeting. Uh, in Alaska, I gave the keynote on uh, climate science in the Arctic, and uh, it was uh, really a highlight of continuing efforts to enhance international collaboration in Arctic science. A year later, uh, I hosted in the White House the first Arctic science ministerial, the first gathering of science ministers from around the world, not just the Arctic nations now, but uh, science ministers from 25 countries and representatives of the major indigenous groups uh, focused on the issues uh, indicated here. Uh, interestingly enough, and I, I didn't have time to put together a slide on this, it was agreed at that meeting that there would be a continuing series of Arctic science ministerials. The second one just took place in October in Berlin. Uh, and it was hosted by the European Union, Germany, and Finland, co-hosted, and reached uh, actually a rather substantial uh, variety of new agreements on collaboration on Arctic science, and most importantly on collaboration around uh, monitoring. So let me make just a couple of uh, off-the-cuff observations uh, on the path forward. Uh, I think the Arctic science community uh, which has been doing an increasingly good job of collaborating, has to continue uh, with that momentum, continue building collaboration. One of the things you notice, we have, of course, very bad relations uh, with Russia at the moment for a variety of reasons, but we still collaborate with Russia in the Arctic and in space, uh, basically because we have to. Uh, Russia owns more territory in the Arctic than anybody. They have a longer coastline in the Arctic than anybody. It is not plausible to talk about international cooperation on the Arctic without Russia. And we continue to have actually good relations with Russia on that particular topic, and it's important that it, that, that be maintained. Uh, secondly, it's important to recognize the interests of non-Arctic nations, the increasing interests of non-Arctic nations, including very conspicuously China, Japan, South Korea, all of which want to fish there. Uh, there is, by the way, uh, a, a very recent agreement uh, postponing fishing in the international central Arctic Ocean waters for 16 years while we try to understand better scientifically what is there and whether it could be managed under fishing in a sustainable way. But the other thing I think everybody in the Arctic science community uh, nationally and internationally needs to do is to speak up about the importance of climate change in the Arctic, its connections to global climate change, its connections to issues that affect everybody, weather and climate in the whole northern hemisphere, sea level around the world. Uh, this should be a vehicle by which we not only underline the importance of Arctic science, but also 
uh, underline the importance of global climate change manifested more rapidly in the Arctic than anywhere else in the world as a sort of a canary in the coal mine. Thank you very much. I need to go off the other side. Yes, yeah. right. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your, your time and also your wisdom. So we'll get back on schedule here uh, this morning. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Severinghouse. He's a professor of geosciences in the Geosciences Research Division of Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. His current research in the center of using trapped bubbles of gas contained in ice cores to track changes in ancient climate. And he is also a member of the National Academy. Jeff, welcome. Hi there. Uh, and now for something completely different. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about the, the past 60 years of abrupt climate change research. And I assure you, I won't do a good job of it because <laughs> I've only been given like 15 minutes. So I apologize that this is uh, going to omit your favorite topic. I'm, I'm sure I will piss off uh, half of you, but so here we go anyway. So um, this uh, picture on the left, many of you will recognize. It's sort of an iconic uh, uh, symbol of abrupt climate change. And what it is, is the last 20,000 years in uh, the Greenland GISP-2 ice core, uh, time going from the left to the right. And the green line is the temperature that uh, we reconstructed from the ice core. And the point of this is that there were very rapid changes happening in as little as a few years. Um, and d that's in stri striking contrast to the last 10,000 years here, a time in which human agriculture and civilization developed. And so it's, it seems very likely that our ancestors would not have been able to develop agriculture and civilization if this kind of climate behavior uh, had continued. And so that's sort of the, the first message uh, I'd like you to take home. If you take home nothing else, please take home that uh, climate change, abrupt climate change, matters a lot. Um, we probably wouldn't be here if it hadn't uh, quit happening. And in, fa in fact, these abrupt events are, are uh, uh, pretty common over the past 100,000 years. They occurred 25 times over the last 100,000 years. And so I'll, I'll go on to talk um, uh, more about these, but I'll also focus on ice cores. Here you see a picture of somebody taking an ice core out of its storage tube in the uh, National Science Foundation ice core facility, which is now called the ICF, or ice core facility. It used to be called National Ice Core Lab, or Nickel. So if you hear someone say Nickel, you can correct them. It's now called the ICF. And um, it's an amazing facility. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. And uh, there's uh, literally uh, tw uh, more than 20 kilometers of ice cores uh, in this facility. It's an astonishing uh, uh, precious resource that we really need to uh, nurture and take care of. And uh, people do come from all over the world to, to, to use the ice samples here. So how do I advance? OK. Yeah. So what is abrupt climate change? Well, you know, there, there's many things um, that happen fast, but abrupt climate change is, is not necessarily um, just all fast things. For example, a, a meteorite impact is not considered abrupt climate change. And the reason is that it's a transition between two different stable states. And so the, the concept of abrupt climate change requires some state stability in one state and then a switch to another quasi-stable state. And so I've just copied Richard Allied's nice little cartoon here um, of, you imagine a, a curved uh, pan that has a, a ball that can roll back and forth in it and it's on a fulcrum so it can be tipped. Well, I think you can imagine that um, there's sort of two different stable states here. The ball can either be here or it can be here. And if you push on the, the pan a little bit and, and rock it, you're probably not gonna move the position of the ball. So that, let's consider that a stable state in terms of the ball like moving side to side. 
if you want, you can think of the x-axis here as temperature. You know, if, if the ball doesn't move side to side, uh, you haven't really changed your temperature. So let's think of that as like one stable state. But if you disturb it enough, if you push it hard enough, you can actually get the ball to, to roll to this point here, which I think you can imagine is a threshold. When the ball rolls over the threshold, it goes really fast. And, and uh, it, it zooms into this other stable state, and it's stuck there in, a, in another stable state. Okay, so that brings me to the, the most important aspect or uh, characteristic of abrupt climate change, which is that the, the change itself proceeds faster, usually, than the forcing that did it. And, and it, in any case, it proceeds at the speed that's set by the underlying system, not by the forcing, okay? So that's the, the key point here. So the, the relevance to our current human situation is largely that greenhouse gas forcing is, is relatively slow compared to these processes that happen in a few years. And, and so we could be gradually forcing the system and then suddenly have it cross a threshold that we were unaware of, and that's why I think this topic of abrupt climate change has attracted so much attention over, over the past 50, 60 years. Um, so why should we care about abrupt climate change? Well, um, I just told you one of the reasons, but there's actually a lot of reasons. I, I thought I'd just focus on, on this one particular reason because it, it has a, a big uh, potential uh, to harm a lot of people. Tropical rain-fed agriculture uh, currently supports over a, a billion people, mostly in the northern hemisphere tropics. And it, and it turns out that the uh, rain belts, the tropical rain belts, also like to stay in, in the northern hemisphere tropics under the current climate state. But from studying uh, the past records of abrupt climate change, we know that that can change and change quickly. There are these events, you know, something like 25 of them in the last ice age where the tropical rain belts abruptly, and I mean like in two years, shifted into the southern hemisphere. Guess what happened to all those northern tropical places that people live now? They dried out. Big time drought. Yeah, and so, so this is potentially a, a big deal. Um, and that's why I think we should care about uh, uh, abrupt climate change. Another Reason is that just by studying the record of abrupt, abrupt climate change, we've learned some important things about how our planet works. We know now that the uh, tropical rain belt is sensitive to the, the relative temperature between the two hemispheres, and it always tends to migrate toward the warmer hemisphere. And, and so this actually uh, matters. Let's say that our descendants uh, decide that they're so sick of having a, a hot world, they're going to spray sulfate aerosol in the stratosphere to cool everything down, okay? But let's say they want to save money so they don't do it in the southern hemisphere because most of the people live in the northern hemisphere, right? Well, that would be a catastrophic mistake because by, by cooling the northern hemisphere only, you shift the Earth's thermal equator south. And guess what? The rain belts will follow that thermal equator and you'll have drought in the northern tropics where those one billion people live. Okay, so now I'm getting into the historical part of this talk. Uh, 60 years ago, uh, amazingly, uh, this is just a coincidence as far as I know, the, f the first use of air bubbles trapped uh, in ice core for learning about the past atmosphere uh, was tried, and, and this is um, in 1958, the same year that the Polar Research Board uh, was founded. Um, so uh, these two uh, very creative, brilliant people, uh, Per Scholander and, and Willie Dansgaard, uh, went up to Greenland and, and pulled icebergs out of a, a fjord and hoisted them onto the deck of a ship, and sliced them up, put them in vacuum chambers, melted them, and extracted the ancient air that was inside. This is just amazing that, you know, they had this idea that you could get CO2 out of the bubbles and, and uh, make dating of ice cores, you know, possible. Well, it turns out that it's, there's some contaminating issues. And so, you know, we do not actually use this technique 
uh, today. They had no way of knowing about these contaminating issues, but it, it's just incredible what they did. They did date a whole bunch of icebergs, and they found range, ages ranging up to 3,000 years, and um, the, the older ones had uh, more negative uh, uh, delta O18 values, for those of you who know that term, indicating colder conditions. Well, that, that totally makes sense uh, in a glaciological context because the oldest icebergs had to come from the highest altitude, and then that means they take the, you know, the longest to, to get to the coast, but they're, they're also colder because they're at from higher altitude. So this is uh, just a really fun uh, thing to, to ponder that, you know, in, I, I actually personally make my living by studying the air in the bubbles, and so this guy um, is sort of one of my heroes, Per Scholander. He was actually a, a biologist, a, a physiologist, and he was at the Scripps Institution of, of Oceanography uh, for a while, and, and uh, he uh, got interested in this uh, idea that you could preserve ancient atmosphere in air bubbles because he was trying to figure out how uh, insect larvae managed to live uh, in the ice on a pond uh, throughout the winter. And biologists you know, told him that the larvae could live because oxygen was diffusing through the ice quickly enough to keep them alive all winter long. He, being an experimentalist, went out and measured the rate that oxygen diffuses through ice and, it, and found it was orders of magnitude lower than the biologists thought. And so he said, well, they must be living some other way. Maybe they're just you know, down-regulating their metabolism to live through the winter, which probably is the, the true answer. But then he got this idea. He said, well, if, if the gases diffuse through the ice that slowly, these bubbles might have ancient atmosphere still well-preserved. And he was right. So that's uh, how many of us in the gas, ice core gas world <laughs> make our living these days, which is an astonishing discovery. Um, and then the next sort of part of this story is that uh, in the 19, early 1960s, uh, Willie Dansgaard, who's on the left here, uh, was the, in, invented this technique of measuring past temperatures uh, uh, using the isotopic composition of oxygen and hydrogen in water, in, in glacial ice. And, and, uh, and so this is a great example of how international collaboration in the polar regions has, has been with us right from day one, <laughs> even before the very first um, you know, scientific measurements were made. This um, ice core drill was uh, d uh, built by the U.S. Army, uh, and they were drilling underneath uh, the ice, uh, not for scientific reasons, but because they wanted to make sure that their uh, nuclear-hardened uh, uh, test facility in, in North uh, Greenland would actually survive an atomic blast or something like that. So this was more of an engineering study. But they drilled an ice core, and they, they drilled it very carefully. And, and uh, once it was all done, um, uh, the uh, American who's in the middle, uh, Langway, asked uh, the Dane, uh, Willie Dansgaard, uh, to measure the uh, Delta O18 on the ice core to get a climate record. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, Hans Uschker, who's on the right, was interested in, in CO2. So he was measuring CO2 concentrations uh, in the air bubbles. By the way, that didn't work. It turned out there's too much dust in Greenland ice to get um, you know, viable uh, CO2. But um, that, you know, that's the way science goes. You try something, you find it doesn't work. Later, we found that Antarctic ice is clean enough, so that's where we get our CO2 concentration information is from, from Antarctic ice. But the important thing I wanted to point out here is that even in this very, very first ice core, which is called the Camp Century Ice Core, Willie Dansgaard found these wild uh, fluctuations, which we now call the dansgaard Ushker events or abrupt climate changes, and those are the 25 events that I mentioned before right there. So in the very first ice core ever drilled from <laughs> anywhere on Earth, you can see the abrupt climate change events. It's been with us right from the beginning. It's so interesting. But nobody trusted it. You see, pe there were all these questions about whether the ice had been folded and faulted. So, so this was just a very tentative 
conclusion and warranted going back and drilling more cores, and that's exactly what happened. And so in the next four decades, um, um, more than and six deep ice cores were, were drilled um, all over uh, Greenland, and, and, you know, and, and five of them um, well into the um, last glacial period, showing all of these rapid climate change events, the Dansgaard. Ushker events in excruciating uh, detail. And so I don't have time to go through all of this, but this has been an enormous uh, scientific uh, leap ahead to really understand these things and how they work. I'll just tell you uh, in a cartoon fashion the, the leading current understanding of how they work. Basically, they are switching on and switching off of the North Atlantic currents here. You see the, the North Atlantic drift here. This current um, today brings warm water into the high latitudes, which keeps the high latitudes from getting all iced up uh, during winter. And that thing has been um, interrupted repeatedly, uh, at apparently 25 times during the last cycle by these abrupt events. Now I'm running out of time, so I just want to um, say that these things are not just confined to Greenland. Uh, we've now learned that there's strong tropical impacts from methane and oxygen 18 of O2, which is uh, produced by photosynthesis and nitrous oxide. And uh, so uh, what they tell us effectively is that virtually the whole northern hemisphere was involved. And there was also an opposite reaction in the southern hemisphere. And so here you see sort of the state of the art. This is from the recent waste divide ice core. And here's the, the Greenland Delta 18 record, the sort of classical thing with all these abrupt events. And then the methane is shown below in green. You see the methane um, looks almost exactly like the O18. So, but methane is made in the tropics. So you, this tells us that the tropics were involved in particular tropical rainfall. And in Antarctica, you, you have essentially um, an anti-phased and, and lagged uh, response. So um, I'm going to just finish by saying um, that um, drought leads to failed states and conflict. So we should think hard about uh, how um, shifts of the Earth's thermal equator might happen in the future and whether we want them to happen. Um, and also think broadly about the impacts of shifting rain belts. I think that's the main takeaway, so thank you. We'll have to move on to our next talk, uh, which is by Dr. Robin Bell. Robin is currently serving as AGU president-elect, I don't know why, she will become president in 2019. She is the Palisades Geophysical Institute Lamont Research Professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where she directs research programs in Antarctica and Greenland, leads research on the ice sheets, plate tectonics, and rivers, and leads the development of technology to monitor our changing planet. She's also a past chair of the Polar Research Board. So you got three of them up here. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for being here today when <laughs> this gang reached out to me to see if I would talk. I reached out to Terry. Okay, I go, Terry, if we're going to talk, we're going to put together a talk together. But of course, she went to Antarctica, so. <laughs> and has, or it's even better. Last I heard from her, she was sitting on top of her little house on top of the rim of a volcano on her way to Antarctica. So she's had some input. <laughs> So what we're, I want to talk about is sort of how uh, our community over the last, you know, 60 years and looking forward has seen changes and then how we have some challenges looking forward and going to touch on our community, the ice, why it matters and sort of my five points on how I think polar science really needs to move forward. So we'll just start with our community. Um, I just like the way that you even see the change. This is, you know, what we think classically of polar research. Some maybe color. You know, this was the polar research at the starting of the polar research board, and and actually the launching of the first IPY. We have lots of guys with ties standing in front of the <laughs> buildings here. Um, we have 
guys with beards driving, driving traverses across. But what's really wonderful in the last 60 years, we've actually seen a big change. You know, there's more color of many different times. There's a more diverse people at the table. And this is one of the key issues. We actually need to have a diverse scientific community because all the research, because we like research, shows we make better decisions and we're more creative if we have a diverse group of people at the table and feeling welcome. So that's one of the awesome changes we've seen. I don't think we're totally there yet. Um, I think we still need to work on being more inclusive, but we're getting there. You can see that there's a, a much more diverse set of faces. Um, so it's more diverse. It's also, there are a lot more nations involved now. Um, these are essential. Um, our, much of our science is still impossible to do if we don't do it with international collaboration. Antarctica is a tough place, as, the, as we heard about, from Holdren about the Arctic. Antarctica is still a hard place to work, and if we're, we're going to solve the wicked problems that I think Tom's going to talk about, we actually need international collaboration. It's essential for our science. So looking forward, I think we need to continue to look how to be more diverse and more international. Um, let's see if we'll, this will run. Is there a mouse? Can you start it? Um, as I was saying to Jeff, I show this everywhere I go just because I always think it's important to remind ourselves what is the evidence the ice sheets are changing, you know, and that we have really solid evidence. We have like three independent measurements. The ice sheets are going twice as fast as they were in the 1990s. This is Pine Island Glacier in Antarctica, West Antarctica, and in the same place we see that the ice sheet's getting lower. Again, a separate measurement. That's kind of the that's kind of the gold standard in science, independent measurements showing the same thing. And I don't have to tell you that ice stretches and thins, and that's why it gets lower. Um, and then we have the third, independent measurement. Oops, no, we don't. We need to go to the next slide. And that's where we'll get the independent measurement. And, um, and we have the beautiful measurements from GRACE that, again, show us at the same place the ice sheets are losing mass. This is something that we couldn't even imagine when we, the Polar Research Board was founded and people were driving across the ice sheets on traverse vehicles and making seismic and gravity measurements. They were just amazed, A, how thin, thick the ice was. Remembering that was the, one of the big insights from the International, Polar, International Geophysical Year in Antarctica, and that there was a hidden mountain range there. You know, the, the, the almost came out of the top. Next slide, please. Oops, we're going to watch it again. Yes, the ice is changing. Yes, it's changing faster than we thought. And I like to argue, no, we don't exactly understand all the mechanisms of how the ice sheets work. Um, next slide, please. And there'll be a movie if you can start it. We have models. You know, they're, they're starting to tell us how ice sheets can change fast. But, um, and these are the models that are underlying a lot of what we're giving to our communities and for them to predict on how to go forward. And this is one of my favorite of Rob and Dave's models. It shows you how in a very accelerated warming world, you see water collecting on the top of the ice shelves and them collapsing quickly. But I don't think we're there yet. Next slide. Because we don't have all the processes in our models. What our documentation of how the ice sheets are changing is very much based on the satellite record. But as I always like to say, you need to get up close and personal with the ice sheets to actually get all the processes of how the ice works. And this has just always been my favorite in my conversations with Rob about why I think his models could be improved, because <laughs> that model we saw where the ice sheets collapsed were dependent on water staying in one place on top of the ice shelves. It's very clear that it is possible to develop surface hydrology on top of ice shelves. It's something we really haven't seen much of, therefore we haven't thought much, much about it, and it's not in our models. So again, we need to get up close and personal. We need to think about how ice sheets might behave in the future, and we need to bring in other communities to understand things like ice sheet hydrology. Next slide. And why does it matter? One thing I find, uh, I'm a sailor, so it means I go to coastal places. I'm always very struck by where we go around the world, whether it's right up the river. The top one is, might look like New Orleans last year. It's actually not. It's uh, 
30 miles up the river from New York City on the Hudson River. Those houses were trashed in Sandy. And now the only way that people were allowed to rebuild them is on stilts. That is not New Orleans. That's New York City. That's north of New York City. Those people are really concerned about what the future will look like. As are people around the globe. Um, we, went, we went to Senegal, and all those people standing on that edge of Ile de Gore, the place that the Pope apologized for uh, slavery, and Obama stood in the doorway, are worried about sea level in their communities. They're from communities around West Africa. So it really is a global problem. It is really our responsibility to figure out how to serve our communities. Next slide. Uh, and we know, you know, just in case you hadn't heard, that <laughs> sea level really is going up. It's not going up uniformly. This is one of the things I think is challenging for us. We like to think we're going to give communities an answer, but it's going up. Next slide. Even here, if you took a bike ride south, uh, I think it's a 17-minute bike ride south from here, there's actually one of these wonderful NOAA tide gauges with a uh, pipe in the water, this high-tech stuff. Next slide. And this is what the record since uh, the 1930s. Can you click it, please? And as I like to say, that's almost, that means in the last 100 years, it's almost right here, the water's almost gone up to your knee. We don't think about that. We don't, that if you were down standing near um, the baseball stadium down there, 100 years ago, the water would have been deeper. If you stood there for 100 years, kind of boring, but the sea level would have come up to your knee. Next slide. And what can we tell them? Click once. These are our projections. This is not very helpful to the communities, right? And this doesn't include anything about how the sediments might come down the Potomac or how <laughs> the swamp in Washington might continue to subside. There are all sorts of missing processes in here. Our communities need a little bit more fidelity on whether or not it's going to come up to my hip or way over my head. That, that's supposed to be a six meter, two meter person, by the way. That's my reference. Um, <laughs> next slide. Um, so what I like to think is, click please, is we're about where um, weather predictions were in the 1970s, and this is where you could tell a hurricane was uh, 96 hours out in the 1970s. Click please, and. Um, that's what we can do now. We have a lot of work to do to help our communities know whether or not sea level is going to impact them and how they should plan. Next slide. I don't know why I'm doing asking, but thanks. That's really. So why does it matter? It really matters, but I also think we cannot forget that we are really privileged to work in one of the most beautiful places on our planet and that we have to continue to convey the wow, the beauty, and the awesome discovery that we have the privilege to be able to do. Um, let's see, if maybe I can do the next. Nope, it's not working. You do the next slide. So you know, I like to you know, just share the, my two. I just thought I'd share one from my work and one from Terry's work, just because why not? It, this is where, because of the international collaboration facilitated by the International Polar Year, seven nations went to the top of the, Gember, the, top of the Antarctic ice sheet. Next slide, please. And this is the mountain range that's underneath there, size of the brook range, totally covered by ice. Nobody had really been there since the year I was born in 1958, during the International Geophysical Year. And what did we find? We found that water runs uphill in this mountain range and then freezes back on. I mean, how cool is that? Our planet is amazing and beautiful. And we need to understand those processes if we're going to tell our communities what the future looks like. Next slide. And then also a real result of international collaboration and bringing people together, Terry's work to develop PolNet and actually watching the Earth move. Next slide. Um, and they published this year that we actually can see, you, if you say 45 millimeters a year, that doesn't actually mean anything. Look at your thumb. It really is going up that much every year. That's a, my thumb's not that big, but that is, you can think about that much going up every year, and that's because the ice sheets are changing. Our planet is just amazing, and our ability as scientists to measure it is one of these things we should share, not just we're going to drown you, but that <laughs> our home is beautiful and we are working to understand it better. Next slide. Um, and the other facet of science that be, has become really clear to me is that if we're going to understand how those processes work, we actually have to break down the silos between the different communities to understand things, how to work. 
as a system. This is just a one-slide summary of the Rosetta Ice Project, which was mapping the entire Ross Ice Shelf. You might say, well, that's kind of boring. We know that's stable. But we had to bring together oceanographers, ice people, glaciologists, we could normally call them, um, and tectonics specialists. And with that, we discovered that the tectonics are controlling how the warming water is or isn't getting underneath that ice shelf, and the vulnerability is not at the grounding line, our paradigm often, that the grounding lines are the most sensitive place, but the sensitivity is at the front of the ice shelf where interannual warming can get in. Get in. And we only reached that conclusion because we had all these different scientific views at the table, the ability to look at the problem from different ways. That's why I think we need convergent science, because as long as we each only talk to, as long as I just talk to the glaciologists and the oceanographers don't talk to ice people, we actually aren't going to get to where we need to be which is back to those communities standing on the edge. Next slide. Um, and we also need to think about, this is just one idea I've been mulling over, is that we really need to start looking at the ice, the solid earth, and the ocean together. We've been putting together the concept of having rings around Antarctica, where we actually really constrain the flux of energy and the key processes, both at the ice edge and at the grounding line. Again, something we can't do as individual nations or individual disciplines. Um, we're just starting to call it an Antarctic circumpolar interdisciplinary surveys, flux gates around the in grounding line, bathymetry in front of the grounding line, and ocean properties out to the continental shelf. Just again, understanding in a comprehensive, convergent way how that change we saw is so rapidly happening, is happening and in better informing those communities around the globe. Um, I think we need to do one more step. Not only do we need to figure out how to work together, but I think we need to improve how we link our science of changing ice with the global coastlines. It's very clear when we look at that little NOAA map of arrows that, that they aren't all going the same direction. Um, as I like to say, yes, ice melts, but the ocean warms, land subsides, <laughs> rebound happens, and gravity matters. <laughs> You know, and, he, and we have been living in silos, right? And what we really, what our, com oh right, I forgot one. And coastals, and coastlines respond. If we live in any one of those silos, we're gonna give our communities the wrong number to plan for the future. And if this is the one that just struck me last week, I know if you listen to radio, you would have missed this beautiful image, but I read radio a lot. So this was NPR's piece on um, Del Mar pr responding to future, sea level rise and how they're going to approach. And what just struck me is this town where you can see there's longshore sediment transport, there's wetlands that are probably subsiding, and there's a delta moving water, out, moving sediments out to the coast. They're using one number for their future planning across the whole place. This has nothing to do probably what's going to happen because we know the coastline's going to respond in a different way. So, I don't know, somehow I needed to click this a couple times to get it to change. We'll see, can you get it to change? We'll just might get, we'll both hit the button. I know, it's amazing. The NPR just is not gonna let me go. To, oh, there, so where should we go in our future? To build our future Antarctic communities, we need to look at more diversity to foster better ideas and solutions. But we need to continue to share the awe and beauty. That's why I wore an ice sheet dress last night, because I'm just so adamant that we need to convey the beauty of our science and not just scare people. We need to continue to foster more international collaboration, because there are things we cannot do alone as individual nations. And we need to bring the, the different disciplines together. We need to break down those silos, because then we'll have deep, deeper insights into how the ice, ocean, atmosphere system works. And then finally, we need to figure out how to link the changing ice with the changing coastlines, because then our science is going to be more useful. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for your leadership. All right, we're running just a little bit behind schedule. I apologize for that. Um, but our next speaker is Jody Deming. She's the Carl Bantz Endowed Professor at the University of Washington. 
She's an oceanographer who is currently exploring the limits of microbial life in the Arctic Ocean and its ice cover. She's been elected to the American Academy of Microbiology and to the U U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Jody. Thank you for the invitation to speak today, especially since I'm a biologist, and biology was not even on the list for IGY 60 years ago. But one of the very first activities of the IGY completely changed our ability to understand the scale of biology on this planet. And that's the development of satellites, so beautifully shown in this image here, where what you're seeing is a phytoplankton bloom on the scale of hundreds of kilometers, with the responsible organism being only a few micrometers in size. And each organism is covered with these calcium carbonate tests that uh, reflect the light, which make it possible to see this massive bloom by satellite. Also give greater density to the organism, so they sink to the seafloor. Um, and make them vulnerable to ocean acidification and the redissolution of their tests. And every word and concept I just said did not exist 60 years ago, and everything else I will say did not exist 60 years ago either. Well, that was in the open water, but for the polar environments covered with ice, uh, how do we study and recognize life there? Uh, even the earliest of Arctic explorers uh, even if they didn't know they were looking at it, could see uh, algal growth on the underside of sea ice as it turned over, often mistaken as sediments. Uh, these algae are typically diatoms, and they have glass tests made of silicate, also gives them density to sink. Oh, excuse me, I wanted to mention that uh, just in the last two years, Thomas Mock and his colleagues have obtained the complete genome sequence for this polar diatom, which is a first, and so look forward in the coming years to some advances on adaptation and evolution uh, in, the, in this whole group of organisms. How can we get at the scale of life that lives on the underside of sea ice? Satellites can't see this. What are our options here? Uh, a lot of us have been poking pinpricks in the ice cover with ice cores to recover what's on the underside of the ice, and there have been some elegant experiments done by divers, but this doesn't get us the scale of the phenomenon. We can look forward in the coming years to technology solving this problem for us as ROVs, AUVs, gliders, smart floats are deployed under the ice to give us this larger scale view of the biology under the ice. Yet we know that the biology is rich. We can see it on the seafloor. Uh, the organisms that live on hard bottoms are really beautiful to photograph, but I have to say that most of that seafloor is muddy and ugly. <laughs> uh, and it's hard to get a beautiful picture of them, but I hope you can see some of the organisms scurrying about on the surface of this continental shelf in the Beaufort Sea with an order of magnitude more biomass that you can't see buried in the sediments. What you can also see in this image is an ice keel that's scouring the seafloor here from a pressure ridge above. So this is a rather physically dynamic place to have to live. When the first icebreaker was, was equipped with a multi-beam, we could begin to get a macro scale view of the seafloor, but not at the biological level, not yet. So we still are dependent on the top predators telling us that it's a rich ecosystem. So the whales, the walruses, the seals, the diving seabirds who depend, make their living on feeding off the seafloor, uh, inform us of the richness of the current ecosystem, leaving their marks on the seafloor 10 centimeters deep. But this is on the continental shelf where the connectivity between the surface and the seafloor is very efficient, pelagic benthic coupling. What about in the high Arctic where the ice has always been thicker over the North Pole? Uh, this is changing as well, or now we know it's changing, with the detection of massive diatom blooms under the ice, recovered from the deep seafloor, 4,400 meters deep, fresh stuff down there with 
in situ photography to show that it's being grazed right away. This is possible because the ice is thinner now and more light is delivered to the organisms to bloom underneath the ice. But things are changing. And they're not only changing in the ice. Here's a typical situation with the ice algae growing on the underside of the ice, but the water itself is fairly clear. Not so, so much anymore. Not so many years ago, Kevin Arrigo and Don Perovich and their colleagues on an ice-breaking expedition in the Chukchi Sea ran into this pea soup, uh, not in the ice, but in the water column below. And yet, you have an ice cover above. So how is that possible? And what they deduced was that the increased occurrence and earlier occurrence of melt ponds on the surface of the ice that's still there actually focuses light down below and stimulates the phytoplankton that are in the water below. So this shifts the ecosystem. You can expect in the coming years to see lots of work on the shift from a benthic rich system to a pelagic rich system, which will have influences on fisheries and food security in the northern and southern world. But we still have ice. So how is it possible for organisms to live inside of the ice? And now we go in the opposite scalar direction, trying to visualize the microscale habitats of these organisms. Hayo Eichen, Ken Golden, and others have helped us to visualize and understand the briny environments inside of sea ice at the millimeter scale, which is still three orders of magnitude too large. So we've learned how to look into the ice directly at the scale of the organisms, and here you can see two healthy pairs of diatoms overwintering in a brine inclusion in the ice. And with DNA stains, you can see the many more numerous bacteria, the smallest living forms of life, populating ice. And all of these organisms are living in a goo of sugars which you can see by staining and even just by the naked eye through the microscope without staining. These are natural gelatinous antifreeze compounds. And if you make artificial ice with and without this sugary material, you can show that the material increases the porosity of the ice, makes more inhabitable space in the ice, and at the highest resolution, the pores can be seen to be fractal and interconnected. So here's a, an amazing example of microscopic life altering the physics of its environment to improve it and make it more habitable. And a lot more is going on inside these pores because sea ice concentrates not just salt and these polymers, but also enzymes, organic carbon, nutrients, bacteria, viruses, you name it. And this is an ideal set of conditions for what we call lateral gene transfer. So this is an accelerated form of evolution and adaptation where typically a virus will deliver a new gene to uh, its host and, f and make more rapid the evolutionary process. I've dubbed this the evolutionary playground, even though the, the conditions are quite extreme here. And maybe because they are extreme that this can happen. It's not just happening inside the ice, but we're discovering even in recent years that uh, as we have more new ice forming in the wintertime, uh, we get increased fields of frost flowers, and each of these frost flowers is a microbial hotspot. But what if the ice isn't thin? What if the ice is thick and not saline, but freshwater glacial ice with vanishingly small amounts of brine to inhabit? Now the question becomes, is there life underneath all of this ice? And uh, Lake Vostok is famous for uh, decades of effort to try to get to that lake below it. And there have been papers detecting uh, microbial life in the accreted ice and in the water punched through finally. But this will probably always be controversial because of the drilling fluid contamination. So people have turned to other subglacial lakes in Antarctica, since we now have, we now know we have hundreds of these, which I suspect we'll hear more about later. Um, and just recently, uh, Brent Christner and his colleagues uh, working at Lake Willans have broken through to the ecosystem below there, and I can say ecosystem. There is a microbial ecosystem active and verified uh, underneath uh, the glacial at Lake Willans. 
In the Taylor Valley, Jill McCuckey and her colleagues have been studying for a number of years Blood Falls, this amazing um, outburst of briny material from below Taylor Glacier. It's red because of iron oxidation, but she has and her colleagues have been able to demonstrate yet another microbial ecosystem in this briny subsurface. She also recently acquired the first uh, air flight resistivity profile going from McMurdo Sound on the right all the way to Blood Falls and Taylor Glacier on the left. And if you just focus on the dark blue color, that's the indication of briny sediments. That's the extent in this one local uh, region of Antarctica where you can expect microbial life, microbial ecosystems at work. And so expect more research coming out of this explaining these ecosystems. We have such brine saturated sediments in Arctic permafrost as well as first uh, documented by the Russian scientist David Gilichinsky and his colleagues. Fortunately, we have them near Utyakvik, Alaska as well, where geologist Jerry Brown and his colleagues excavated a permafrost tunnel in the early 60s, so not so long after IGY happened, and gave us permission to climb into the frozen bowels of the earth. Um, that's probably my last expedition. <laughs> um, and here we have extracted from below the floor of this tunnel precious volume of ancient ocean, a minimum age of 11,000 years old, which is a bacterial soup at minus six degrees and 120 parts per thousand. More bacteria, 10 to the eighth per mil, than we've seen anywhere in the marine environment. More dissolved organic carbon in millimolar levels than we see anywhere in the marine environment or many terrestrial environments. So you can be sure that we're throwing every genomic tool in the work box at this community to find out what's happening here. So stay tuned for that. I wanted to mention that it's not only the basic research that comes out of this sort of work, because uh, this permafrost tunnel is not dissimilar from ice cellars that people of the north have been using for generations to store their meats over winter. And they have been observing in recent years that red colored brines are seeping into their ice cellars and impacting their food supply. They have to clean out their cellars more frequently. So there is a direct application here for understanding uh, what these communities are doing. So as we worry about these uh, changes that are happening that are uh, changing our ecosystems, changing our food supply. Um, I'm also here to tell you that the age of discovery in polar regions is not over yet. Just three years ago, um, hydrothermal vent scientists exploring for new vents off the coast of Greenland took a sediment core and from that core, I won't go into much detail here, but just to show you that genomic analyses have uncovered a new form of microscopic life, which they've named Loki archaeota. Say that three times, it's fun. The Loki archaeota turn out to be a missing link. They are the last common ancestor on Earth living in polar sediments to all of us, to all eukarya, all higher forms of life. Imagine that, that our last common ancestor is still with us in polar regions. So as we discover more about what's happening in our polar regions, it, about the origins and early evolution of life, it helps us as we explore beyond Earth, where we have ice-covered seas in our own solar system spewing their chemistry which we can recognize as lifelike. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. We do have time for a question. You'll have to wave your arm because we are blind up here. Yes. You have to speak oh, up. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. In a highly Uh, 
Any possible role of what? Um, I, on the origin of life. The subsurface brines that I showed you with that very rich community, those are heterotrophic organisms which are not understood to be the uh, oldest forms of life. So I'm not at this time expecting advances on the origins of life from that particular project. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, 12 metagenomes coming in the pipeline and maybe we will see something unexpected. I think that the microbial world should never be underestimated. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. And I will say, th thank you. I will spend the rest of the day saying Loki Archaeota. Our next speaker is Dr. Samantha Hansen. She is an associate professor and undergraduate program director in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Alabama. Her research interests include fundamental geodynamical processes such as volcanism, mountain building, continental rifting, and craton formation, and a variety of geographic locations, including Antarctica. Samantha. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for coming today. Um, I'm filling in for Terry Wilson because, as Robin mentioned, she ran off and went down to Antarctica. Uh, so, as you've already heard today, much of the session was inspired by the 60th anniversary of SCAR, or the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. And so the goal of today's talk is to highlight the role that this organization has played in Antarctic science. So what is SCAR? SCAR is an interdisciplinary committee that is part of the International Science Council that's aimed at developing and coordinating international scientific research focused on the Antarctic as well as on the Southern Oceans. SCAR researchers are, of course, interested in pushing scientific discoveries, but their work is also very important as it helps to inform the Antarctic Treaty System as well as other governing bodies to promote effective management, decision-making, and policies relevant to the Antarctic environment. So with that in mind, the strategic vision of SCAR is to engage the scientific community, uh, again, in forward-thinking novel approaches to help inform policies uh, related to globally significant issues, uh, specifically those related to Antarctica. And this vision is being accomplished uh, with help from members across 44 different countries around the world. So over the next roughly eight and a half minutes, um, I'm gonna share with you a video that was put together highlighting some of the different research activities of SCAR and its accomplishments over the last 60 years. And then I will come back after that video with a few additional comments. Since 1958, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research has been central in defining the vision and goals of science in Antarctica and has facilitated the implementation of Antarctic science by promoting international and transdisciplinary collaborations. The SCAR Secretariat has been hosted from its creation in 1958 at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge and the Secretariat staff continue to enjoy working in a dedicated, multidisciplinary Polar Institute. In the last 60 years, Antarctic scientists have made astonishing discoveries that have changed how we view our changing world. These discoveries have influenced global policies to ban the use of ozone-depleting chemicals to protect southern ocean ecosystems while managing commercial activity and have informed international discussions on climate change. Reflecting the long understood importance of logistics and support to deliver Antarctic research, SCAR established a working group on logistics in 1960. This group continued until 1988 when the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs was established as a separate organization, holding its first meeting in 1989. SCAR and Comnab continued to work together closely, 
including holding joint executive committee meetings annually and collaborating on parallel fellowship schemes. SCAR plays a key role in supporting international collaborations, but especially for those deep science questions that require planning and development over decades. 45 years ago, the Deep Sea Drilling Project, set up to study ocean history, extended its reach to the Antarctic margin. The first cores from the floor of the Ross Sea and the Southern Ocean showed that the Antarctic ice sheet was millions of years older than expected. And they also framed the climate history of the planet over the last 50 million years. In the decades that followed, SCAR supported Antarctic drilling expeditions from both ship and floating ice platforms. Each decade has seen huge gains in knowledge and understanding from dynamic ice sheets in past warm periods to more stable ice sheets in recent cooler times. In 2018, the International Ocean Discovery Program, IODP, returned to the Ross Sea on Expedition 374. Scientists from 13 different nations participated to look back in time to understand the Antarctica of the future. Expedition 374 of the IODP was the first of four new drilling expeditions that would be achieved by IODP in the next two three years under the coordination of the SCAR Geoscience Past Antarctic Ice Sheet Program. The Antarctic Treaty System has worked alongside SCAR since the IGY to ensure the effective governance of Antarctica as a sanctuary for science. Throughout this nearly 60-year relationship, SCAR has been the main provider of evidence-based scientific advice to the Treaty. SCAR is very well placed to inform and enable intergovernmental initiatives to chart a new course in the global climate effort through its continued ambition for a coordinated international approach to Antarctic science. Uh, I'm a marine biologist and the question for me and not only for me is why should we be concerned about the impact of climate change on southern ocean life? SCAR works together on topics of mutual interest with its sister organization in the Arctic, IASC. This includes the coordination of major projects and meetings, such as the IPY in 2007 to 2008, when a coordinated effort was made to produce a unique data set of polar measurements and research. Major legacies from this work included the creation of the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists and the establishment of the Tinker Muse Prize. The Tinker Muse Prize has been an effective recognition award for Antarctic researchers and raises their profile in many ways. The awardees have covered a range of topics and demonstrated the significant global impact of Antarctic research. It was established to honor Martha Muse, the former president of the Tinker Foundation, and is meant to be a lasting legacy of the IPY. Its goal is to provide recognition of the important work being done by Antarctic scientists and policy makers. Each year I think that it is impossible to select an awardee as accomplished and as qualified as the previous ones. They have all been really great, but each year I am proven wrong. The relationship with the Tinker Foundation developed so successfully, the Foundation funded the 2014 SCAR Horizon Scan activity and several other Antarctic projects in recent years. The Horizon Scan was a community effort which identified the key priorities for Antarctic research for the future. SCAR is moving into its seventh decade and has grown substantially in membership from 12 original members in 1958 to 43 currently. This has only been possible through the engagement and support of thousands of researchers from around the world that comprise the SCAR Antarctic scholarly community, together with the support of the SCAR member organizations. SCAR promotes the highest standards of diversity and equality for the Antarctic research community. The Women in Antarctic Science Wikibon project was a grassroots initiative. Our aim was to improve recognition and visibility of notable women involved in Antarctic research. We called upon the SCAR community for nominations. To date, our pages have been viewed over 290,000 times. We're really proud of our efforts and we thank everyone that's been involved in making this really successful. Um, this has actually been one of the most um, successful Wikibombs ever 
and we're really um, stoked uh, that this is the case. And tonight we're going to show you what we've accomplished. Also, our Wikibomb has been so successful, there are now more pages about Antarctic women than there are about Antarctic men. So... <laughs> Sky has been recognised by major international prizes for its work in scientific support and coordination. In 2002, Sky was awarded the International Cooperation Award by the Prince of Asturias Foundation. The award prize money was used to establish a fellowship scheme for young scientists. In 2013, Sky was awarded the Prix Biodiversité of the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. The prize money from the award is used to support the Prince Albert II Fellowship for Biodiversity, beginning in 2015. Within the community, a variety of events have marked the 60th anniversary for SCAR, including a specially designed SCAR flag, flown on the German research vessel Polarstern and at the Neumeyer Research Station. SCAR is publishing Science in the Snow, which records 60 years of SCAR's history since its formation in 1958, and it will be available to download on the SCAR website. SCAR invites everybody to celebrate its 60th birthday. Hopefully the video has given you a better idea of the different activities that SCAR has been involved in. Uh, this flowchart here on the left shows the governance of SCAR. As shown by the gray boxes, uh, SCAR is primarily dominated by three science groups, geosciences, life sciences, and physical sciences. Uh, though I will note that fairly recently in June, a humanities and social sciences group was also put together, uh, as you can see on the bottom here, and they're starting to get activities underway as well. Under each of those science groups are a number of expert and action groups, which are shown by the red and green boxes. These subsidiary groups basically focus on different topics and or methodologies related to its mother discipline. So for example, in the geosciences group, there are sus subsidiary groups focused on things like volcanism, magnetic mapping, geodetic measurements and modeling, and so forth. Um, additionally, the yellow boxes on the spreadsheet, or the flowchart, uh, represent scientific research programs, or SRPs, associated with each of the science groups. So to take a closer look at those, um, these are the current six SRPs that are under the umbrella of SCAR, and you can see they cover a wide range of topics. I will note that these SRPs are scheduled to end in 2020. So there are already steps being taken to identify the next generation of SCAR SRPs. And SCAR is really looking for community feedback on this. Um, specifically, how can these current SRPs evolve to meet new scientific challenges? And or what new research programs is the polar community really interested in pursuing? So there's definitely room to get involved. SCAR promotes capacity building through a number of initiatives. Uh, for example, in conjunction with the World Meteorological Organization, SCAR sponsors a fellowship for early career scientists. For the more mid and late career scientists, they also sponsor a visiting scholars program that promotes international collaboration and training. And a variety of medals and awards are given uh, to recognize excellence in research, international coordination, and education. SCAR also promotes the free and unrestricted access to Antarctic data. So uh, through a variety of SCAR initiatives, a wide variety of products have been generated, as listed on the slide here. And again, these are available to any interested parties who would like to use them. So SCAR will be very active, not only here at AGU, but in a number of upcoming meetings, uh, the titles, locations, and dates of which are listed here. And of course, you're very welcome to get in contact with any of the members of the US SCAR team if you'd like to get involved and find out more. Um, the current US delegates for SCAR are Deneb Karantz and Alan Weatherwax. 
Uh, you can also get in touch with the representatives from the three different science groups. Their, excuse me, their names are listed here at the bottom. Of course, more information is available on the SCAR website, and specific questions can be emailed to the address listed on the lower right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, because we are behind, we're going to move uh, forward to our next speaker. Dr. Thomas Wagner is a NASA program scientist for the cryosphere. He directs the NASA activities for study of Earth's polar regions, glaciers, ice sheets, and all aspects of climate change and sea level rise. Before joining NASA in early 2009, he was a program director for the Antarctic Earth Sciences at the National Science Foundation. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Other keyboard? Got it. So, a couple of months back, I got a call from some computer scientists, and they wanted to hear about the wicked problems that we work on in polar sciences. And admittedly, I had to go to the web and look it up. And wicked problems are these ones, they're kind of poorly defined, they're changing, they're hard to answer. And so I called these guys back and I said, you do realize this is an average day for us, right? <laughs> this is nothing special. But, uh, it, but it really made me think because I said, wow, you know, like, we really did have these wicked problems in the polar sciences, and we've kind of made tremendous advances when you really think about it. And so in preparing this talk, I tried to go back and get into the mindset of kind of where we were back in 1957, 1958, and what we understood about the polar regions, what we understood even from satellites, right? But I found this quote from John Berendt that he wrote as he was writing something for the IPY in 2007, and he points out, listen, IGY time, right? Not only did we not have a map of Antarctica, but we hadn't even flown over most of it, okay? We didn't know much about it. And as you start to even say, well, when did we get the first satellite pictures? You know, we've been launching satellites 50s, 60s to now, right? Um, in the 60s, we had the Nimbus program. We're starting to get some pictures. But the first real image that we get, right? This is 1972, taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts looking back towards the Earth. And that's the first time we kind of see Antarctica really in all of its glory. But contrast that with where we are today. And I think this quote from Robin Bell really sums it up pretty well. We don't only know that it's changing, but it's changing fast, right? And we also know that the changes that are occurring there are connected up to the rest of the globe, and it's really important to humanity. And we're making great strides on that problem. Now, I put this on top of an image that a lot of you have probably seen. This is from Eric Greenow's group out of UC Irvine where they've merged all the INSAR imagery to produce velocity maps of Antarctica. And it's actually, a, that image is running right now, but think about the granularity, right, with which we image the polar regions now. We can see the velocities all over the place. We can see things at a very, very, very fine scale. I also want to point out, too, the amount of cooperation is extraordinary. You look at those lists of organizations on the right, that's everything from government agencies, scientists and academia, to public-private partnerships that have gotten together. In particular, I would call out Mark Drinkwater from um, WMO, the Polar Space Task Group. Um, Mark works at ESA, but it's chartered under WMO. And people like Yves Crevier from Canada, who've worked really hard on getting data from commercial satellites to do this work. But I think if you really look at where we are today, since the IGY, we have really advanced on a lot of these wicked questions. And the sheer magnitude of the leap has to rank up there with one of the most, the most exceptional projects in all of the earth sciences when you really think how far we come. I can think of other communities where they've been working for 30 years on a model that still nobody uses and can't really advance the field. And look at where we are. All right, I think there are three big things that have led us to the place that we're in right now. Observational tools, really utilizing information technology at its fullest, and also convergence, and I'm gonna run through those now. So very briefly, we've had an observations revolution globally with the satellite program, right? There is something like 20 some odd NASA missions on orbit, there are no emissions, DOD missions that we especially use to, and there's the whole international satellite constellation. And almost all this data is freely available, okay? One of the first really, really important things to come out of the satellite work is certainly studying the extent of the Arctic sea ice and how that was changing. And this is a paper from Claire Parkinson and Don Cavalieri from uh, uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Claire also recently elected, elected AGU fellow and National Academy member. And what they did was kind of spectacular, right? They took passive microwave measurements from space 
and they use that to map sea ice extent. And now think of a wicked problem, right? It's like, well, where are we going with this? What are we trying to understand? How do we put this in the context of a global system? We barely have measurements all over the place, right? And it, it curiously, as recently as 1989, they really couldn't discern any change that they could really understand. Contrast that with where we are today, okay? This is the map of changes in the Arctic sea ice minimum starting in the 70s going to about today. We've seen that precipitous drop. One thing to understand is that this sea ice record is one of our most important climate records overall. This is the kind of thing we can, use, we can either assimilate this data into Earth models or we can test models against it. Think of it like this. If we have sea ice in an area, we know what the water temperature is. As sea ice drifts, we can get a handle on winds and things. And that's a record that we think will go forward. But it's not just sea ice. We also use the satellites that look at color to look at changes in chlorophyll in the ocean. This is some work from Karen Fry and Jackie Grebmeyer came out a few years ago. There's a much newer version of this in the Arctic report card, but we can see changing Arctic ecosystems also from space, right? There are big things happening. The Southern Ocean is generally thought of as a place where we'd suck down CO2 from the atmosphere, but that even looks like it's changing now too, okay? Um, okay, we've had two recent satellite launches that are really important for polar science. GRACE follow-on mission, which is still in commissioning, but may give us an order of magnitude better resolution of our polar ice. Uh, also in the ice, the ice Sat 2 satellite, which you've probably heard about at this meeting, launched less than 90 days ago and is already returning spectacular results. Here is the Antarctic, the, sorry, the Arctic sea ice freeboard, that is the height of the ice above the water, which we then use to invert for thickness. This is work being done by Ron Kwok and Sinead Farrell. This record now also is really important for models. Ice mitigates the flux of moisture and also energy between the ocean and the atmosphere. We have a record now that starts in the 90s with the sub-record, continues through ice sat, scatterometry records, ice bridge, cryosat 2, and now with ISAT 2. We'll be able to look at decadal timescale changes with this kind of work. The GRACE mission has certainly been spectacular. It's one of the places where we first definitively saw how we were losing mass from the ice sheets. It's almost hard to think about the pre-GRACE era. And now with GRACE follow-on, we may get a much better look at this. And people like Isabella Velaconia from UC Irvine, Bea Chato from SUNY Buffalo, are merging these records so we can actually figure out what is being lost by melting versus what's being melted by dynamic flow. We've had a complete revolution in aircraft instruments. This happens to be the NASA P3, but it could equally be the Bass Twin Otter or the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics Twin Otter. There's been a whole bunch of groups that have played a role in this. I would particularly call out Kansas and the Croesus Group for developing these amazing ice penetrating radars, which we can see all kinds of things in the ice and the bed underneath. Lamont Dougherty, Kirsty Tinto, who I think I saw earlier here, leading the way on using gravity. Um, also, the USGS playing a role in magnetometry. But from these aircraft missions, right, we pair these with satellites and we get an amazing high resolution view of the ice sheets. This is a slide from Ken Jezik where we, where we first started the ice bridge mission. We can see the top of the ice sheets and we can measure things like the surface mass balance and changes in elevation. We see the bed underneath the ice, which is really important for the geometry of our models of ice flow. And using gravity, we can even map the cavities on the continental shelf under those floating ice shelves. So we can start to put together a picture of how the ice sheets are connected to the ocean and the atmosphere. And the ice itself has also proven to be a fantastic record. This is a shot from Joe McGregor's work using radar soundings of the ice to figure out where the oldest ice is in Greenland. So we backtrack to a time like the Eemian, which is a time when the planet's warmer and what our world might look like. We find out there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of ice left on Greenland at that time. And then also we made this major discovery of water all over the place. When I started in the USA Antarctic program in 2004, other than Lake Vostok, we generally considered the ice bedrock interface pretty dry. We have this spectacular work out of Helen Fricker's group, right? Where not only do they find water under the ice, they find it moving, inflating and deflating. And I think Helen may set the record for the most number of students that have gone on in the field, certainly in my program. But also too, Sun Yim and Dorothy Hall, also a recent AGU fellow, found that we had melting cover the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet from a combination of scatterometry and modus measurements to look at temperature. And finally, Laura Koenig, also one of the people that led to the discovery of water perched within the Greenland ice sheet, vast aquifers of it. All these things changing our pictures of the ice sheet. Also, too, we've done a lot of really integrative work. And one of the things we discovered, and this is the headlines made from Eric Reno and Ian Jockin group's papers, 
on the retreat of the Pine Island Glacier area of Antarctica, right? Amundsen Sea and Bay Thwaites. We are realizing now that the grounding line is lifting up, water is getting underneath it, fluxing more melting, and we are in unstoppable retreat in those areas. And these are things that we need to include in our models for future sea level rise. There is also one of the most important things in polar science that I think is overlooked. We do certainly have silos, but there has been tremendous strides in breaking those down. And I would particularly cite Andy Shepard from Leeds and Eric Ivins from JPL for getting together the IMB group, the ice sheet mass balance into comparison exercise, where they took people working on altimetry, people working on mass change from GRACE, other data from INSAR measurements, and pulled it all together to say, hey, why do our models about the mass change of Antarctica vary so much? And it turns out when you really rip the hood off the calculations, which is hard to do, it's hard on people's egos, there's real sociological reasons why this doesn't happen in a lot of fields of science, it turned out they generally agreed with an uncertainty. They showed we're losing mass for most of Antarctica except East Antarctica, okay, which may be in balance, although there's more coming out on that soon. We don't just work on the big part of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. We've also studied the big glaciers and ice caps around uh, the Arctic. This is some work out of uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks led by Chris Larson, where they used very precise LIDAR studies to look at all of these small glaciers and ice caps. Now, you've probably all seen the video from James Baylog and others about how we have these increased calving rates. And the tidewater glaciers have all retreated. That's pretty much done. What's happening now, what this work showed, is that we're melting from the top down. Same goes for Greenland. More than half of our mass loss may be melting driven. And these are important things for us to put in our models, our projections, and they require us to really work hard on the connections to the atmosphere. Information technology has also played a major role. Jim Maslanik and Julian Struva's work looking at changes in the age of Arctic sea ice. This is 1983 to 2011. White ice is old ice, blue ice is young ice, and the fact is the planet has a younger, thinner top. They did this through combining massive numbers of observations of passive microwave combined with wind flow and other things to track parcels of ice as they move. Uh, some great work from Alex Gardner and JPL, Ted Scambos and Mark Fonstock, using Landsat image pairs to track the velocity of ice flow on every piece of ice on the planet. Why I think they also get special credit was they immediately put this up for everybody to use. They didn't leak it out in dribs and drabs, okay? And then in modeling, we've made tremendous gains. Uh, Eric Lohr and the ISSM group, the same can be said for Rob DeCanto, Ed Bueller, and Andy Edgeswanden, and PISM and stuff. 10 years ago, when I would get on the phone with modelers, they would say, hey, it's too hard for us to really incorporate the remote sensing observations. We have enough other problems with the models. Now today, we're including everything from velocities through to surface mass balance, through to GIA, through to characteristics of the bed. But here's what's so spectacular. The ice physics has gotten so good, and the resolution of the models has gotten so high that we can now take the evidence from the ice in terms of flow, the crude bed models that we have right now, and then correct back for other things. We can figure out what the heat flux we should, be, should be. We can actually figure out where there are gullies and valleys in the bed that we didn't know were there before. And Matthew Morligan and others at UCI have led the way, identifying all kinds of new features around Greenland. Last, as I wrap up, I just want to talk briefly about convergence. Um, I took this straight off the NSF website, and the point is it's every, for me, convergence is really about bringing things together for a new intellectual framework. Um, this has really been part and parcel of what we do in polar science. Mercer's seminal paper back in the 70s, as the planet warms, sea level's going to rise. Um, Sophie Nowicki has been playing a major role in getting the ice sheet modelers together to work on sea level rise to inform the next IPCC report. One of the things she'll say freely is that, listen, we really need to integrate with the ocean and the atmosphere, and that's the edge of where we're going. Also, too, if you haven't been aware of satellite reanalyses, the idea that we take all the satellite information, then we have physical models of the atmosphere, and we fill in the gaps for the things we don't know. We get wind speeds, we get temperatures, we get precipitation, are revolutionizing the Earth sciences. People like Lynette Beauvert um, and and Brooke Medley at NASA Goddard are working on changes to how we look at the sea ice and also how we look at the land ice. Hey, just wrapping up, since some of the questions that we have in the polar regions are very specific, 
I wonder if CubeSats is something that's going to play a really important for us in the future. This is the new pre-fire mission. It's the size of a loaf of bread, but it measures in the far infrared, and we're hopeful that measurements like this might tell us why we have things like Arctic amplification. And I will also just give a plug for the recent successes of Craig Lee and Pierre Dutroux with gliders under the Ar Antarctic sea ice. I think this is going to change what we really know of the future about the Arctic, in the Antarctic and the Arctic. And I'll close out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Our final speaker in this session is Dr. Helen Fricker. She is a professor of geophysics in the Cecil H. and Ida M. Green Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics at Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. Her research focuses on ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland and their role in the climate system using a combination of satellite, radar, and laser altimetry and other remote sensing data. Helen. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I have, to, I have to say it's Scripps Institution of Oceanography, otherwise Margaret Leinen would be upset if I didn't say that. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Everyone gets it wrong. Um, okay, so this is a very interesting session. It's been amazing. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. And I feel like all the other speakers kind of set me up without even knowing what I was going to talk about. So, great. Um, just kind of fate, I guess. Um, so this was a, um invited talk. Um, Steve Rintoul, um was not able to be here, um, so I'm here in his place. Um, Steve Rintoul lives in Hobart, and that's a lot of long way to travel, carbon emissions and all of that, not a good idea. So here I am representing the team. This is an interesting exercise for us. We, um, the, the video of SCAR showed the horizon scan uh, and the Muse Prize, and what this was was a panel that was held during the horizon scan in 2014. Um, where all the people who won the Muse Prize were on the panel. Um, they were all physically there apart from me. I Skyped in to save carbon, and um, we had a, um, a discussion. Basically, all these different uh, people who have won, received the Muse Prize are all from different disciplines. So this is a great example of convergent interdisciplinary work. But it's also very interesting because all of us, all these names here, I think Matthew England is, is here. I hope so. I think he was going to... And Tim Nash, I think he's here as well. I think they're the only two that are actually here. Rob DeConto went home last night. Um, so the, all of us as a team, we'd never worked together before. So this is a really great opportunity to just work on something. We all together came up with what we thought was going to happen in our areas of expertise in Antarctica over the next 50 years. And that was what our panel discussion was. And this is the paper that came out of that. You might wonder why it came out in 2018. Well, papers take a, take a long time to write, and we kind of added authors every time because the prize kept getting reawarded. So this is the result. Slightly uncomfortable territory for me in some ways because it was really making us look into the future, and it was written in the perspective. This is the key thing about this. This is a narrative. So it's set in 2070, so picture 50 years from now, and it's written looking backwards as what we did over the next 50 years and um, in terms of our emissions and what that did to Antarctica. So just to, uh, that was the Muse Prize. <coughs> um, so this, in the end, came out to coincide with the Davos meeting that was in June. Um, I actually didn't go. Uh, I was on sabbatical in Hobart, so I really didn't want to go all the way around the world to do this, so I was saving carbon again. Um, so um, <coughs> basically five papers were written in this issue. Um, I was actually co-author on two of these papers, which was kind of a coincidence. Um, and so this was a very nice uh, insight, which you might uh, not be aware of. It's really worth looking at. Um, and Michael White gave me the, the statistics for some of these papers, which is kind of amazing. Like, a lot of these papers were really well cited, really well uh, da like downloaded many times. Um, I do have to point out that we need to get more female authors as first author on some of these big profile papers. That's a big pitch that needs to be repeated. Okay, so what was this paper all about? Choosing the future of Antarctica, where are we going to go in the next 50 years based on the different emissions scenarios that we have? So we set them based on the high-end emission scenario and the low-end emission scenario. Um, and the high-end is a representative concentration pathway 8.5. So the high-end, so this, um, this is from the IPCC. Um, oh, I should say that all of this was based on published results and 
sort of extrapolation thereof, obviously, um, that had been published by 2017. So it's kind of like um, a little bit outdated as I'm standing up here now about, a, uh, you know, we've had a year of uh, different um, results by now. But, uh, but this, so this is where we were about a year ago. Um, so the high and the low, so in the high scenario, uh, greenhouse gas emissions remain unchecked, climate continued to warm, policy response was ineffective. Um, and this had large ramifications in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and worldwide impacts. We've heard about a lot of that during this session. Um, and then uh, low um, RCP 2.6, um, and ambitious action was taken to limit greenhouse gas emissions. There was, there was um, policies that were established to reduce uh, pressure on the environment, and this slowed the rate of change in Antarctica. So this is what might happen in 2070, looking backwards. <clears throat> Uh, for those if, if anyone just walked in late. Um, okay, so how does this look in Antarctica, just, just considering Antarctica? Um, and this is really nice because, as we all know, Antarctica is an interconnected system. It connects with the ocean and the atmosphere, and it also has impacts on the global uh, communities, as Robin showed really nicely. Um, and I did not run down to the speaker ready room and change my, <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't do that. So I would have loved to have put some things from previous talks in here. That would have been awesome. Um, so anyway, I'm just not that fast. I'm too tired. It's been a long week. Um, so th these are the different variables that we looked at. I'm actually going to present them in a slightly different order because I realize that, um, I, that more logically they flow in a, a slightly different way. I tend to kind of do that. Um, so we are looking at global air temperature and uh, temperatures first and then what that does to the ice sheet and the sea ice and then all the other aspects of Antarctica, the biological implications, the ecosystem, and then the human presence as well. So I'll run through these um, one by one and I'll talk mainly, I'm going to focus on my expertise because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Um, and there, is two, there are two other authors in the room who hopefully could answer questions if you have anything about the biology and, uh, and the ocean acidification and things like that. Um, so global temperature, low emissions, um, just under one, one degree Celsius, high emissions about 2.9 Celsius. Um, that's global air temperature averaged. Um, Antarctic air temperature, so these are the um, more or less the same. Um, Southern Ocean uh, air temperature, Southern Ocean temperature, these are, these are the, uh, the values that we came up with that. This is, this is numbers that have come from modeling and they're, they're sensible numbers based on what we know. So what does this do to the ice, to the cryosphere? So two different types of ice in Antarctica, as hopefully everybody in this room knows, but just in case I'm going to remind everybody, um, we have sea ice, which floats, which forms from uh, freezing of ocean and floats on the ocean. When it melts, it doesn't raise sea level. That's the key thing, but it does change the albedo, so that's very important. Um, ice shelves and the land ice, when they melt, so the grounded part of the ice affects sea level. So that's the key uh, thing, the difference between land ice and sea ice. So what happens to the sea ice? So in the low emissions scenario, we, um, we came up with a 12% loss. This is based on realistic uh, extrapolations of data that have been acquired to date. Um, and the paper gives a lot more detail of all of these different um, uh, calculations that went into this. High emissions, about 43% loss of the, um, the sea ice extent around Antarctica. Um, ice shelf volume, so I might spend a bit more time on this because this is my region, region, um, area of expertise. Um, so under the low emissions scenario, we, um, we calculated roughly about 8% reduction in volume of, um, of ice shelves, which is a floating part of the land ice. Um, and under the high end, we came up with about just under a quarter, which is a fairly a large, uh, alarmingly large number. Um, just to back up and show where this is coming from, most of this was due to uh, data that, that have been collected from multiple um, radar altimetry missions. So European Space Agency and NASA have um, orbited um, radar altimeters since the early 90s, and we have made calculations of how fast the ice shelves are thinning based on those measurements. And that's what we use for this uh, extrapolation here. The reason why that's important for um, the grounded ice is that once sea ice is, once, sorry, once ice shelves are thinned, they are going to change the amount of, um, of land ice that comes, the grounded ice that goes into the ocean. So they have a bet buttressing role where they're literally pushing back on the grounded ice and preventing that flow. So they're really critical um, sort of where the rubber hits the road in terms of the ice sheets because you've got the atmosphere and the ocean um, acting um, simultaneously on them over different timescales. 
Okay. Oh, and the sea level potential of Antarctica is extremely large. Um, uh, if you add all the basins up together, this is about just under um, six, 60 meters or about 180 feet. Um, and East Antarctica is, is by far the, um, the largest uh, component of that. So just, uh, again, to draw attention to this um, Antarctica and sea level connection. Okay. Um, so the contribution to sea level then, um, this is where I changed the order because I thought that actually came in uh, really nicely under ice shelf volume. Um, so the low end emissions is roughly, um, I can't read that, six centimeters. Um, and the high end is about 27 centimeters. So these numbers are very, very um, sort of average based on various ensembles. There's been updated uh, measurements since then. I will show a couple of those. Rob DeConto gave me a slide to show based on his updates. Um, so I'm going to show those as well. Okay, um, so in terms of ocean acidification, reduced uh, calcification, so low emissions, surface water saturated, high emissions, surface water's corrosive. I, th this is the area that I really do not know anything about. Uh, I'm going to admit that freely, um, and I'm hoping that someone else in the audience could answer things if I get asked about this. Uh, biological invasions, we're going to see under low emissions, there will be slightly more, but under the high emissions, as the ice, um, if, as basically as Antarctica becomes more temperate, you will see more invasions of, of species. Um, ecosystem structure will change slightly too, um, and this is all going to have effects in, in the large, uh, in the long term. Interestingly, human, human presence um, under the low emissions, well, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's going to change a little bit, maybe go up a little bit. But if we have uh, high emissions, that basically means that Antarctica becomes more habitable, which is a strange way to think about it. But um, kind of climate refugees and that kind of thing, is a, it's an odd thing to start thinking about. But these are the sorts of issues we are going to be faced with in our lifetimes. Well, maybe not my lifetime, but if I live as old as Walter, it will be my lifetime. Walter Monk just turned 101, so... There's optimism. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so resource use, that's going to change as well. We're going to see more um, people come, uh, fishing and things under high emissions, low emissions that uh, may, may just continue more or less as usual. So this is um, basically what we, update, what we based everything on, uh, De Conto and Pollard. These numbers have actually changed slightly since then, so I just wanted to show you what we're basing. This on this is a Conto and Pollard uh, 2016 because Rob was one of our uh, co-authors on here. So this is um, the uh, global average uh, sea level curves going up to 2100 on the left and 2500 uh, over on the right. Um, so the high end and the low end. High end is the red curve and the low end is the blue curve. Um, so this is a graphic that was put together based on what Antarctica might look like under the high emissions um, in 50 years. So this is in 2070, what the, um, the sort of edges of the continent might look like and what we might start to see. Um, I can't go into all these details. My time is sort of running out. I've got a few more things I wanted to go into, but this was um, really an interesting figure to put together. It took a long time. Our graphic artist was really annoyed with us because we kept making changes. All these things that you might see, it, it, you get into this sort of um, really thinking hard about, about the future and what, what might happen. Um, okay, so this was um, some results that we considered during the study. Uh, Golidge et al. Uh, published in 2015. So these are the two scenarios. On the top, we have uh, RCP 2.6, and on the bottom, RCP 8.5. Um, so this is 2100, 2300, and then going into uh, 5,000 years from now. And they all see um, the, this deglaciation or loss of land ice or grounded ice cover um, on the Antarctic ice sheet and very large responses over in West Antarctica in particular um, and looking like Thwaites um, is incredibly vulnerable, which brings me nearly to... Okay, so this is um, the De Conto and Pollard again, showing a very similar uh, thing here where we're losing the ice over on the west side. Um, so these are the updated numbers that Rob provided. This is actually in review. Um, some of you might have been in the session yesterday. It was incredibly entertaining, like very, very lots of discussion and very, very, this is a really uh, critical 
uh, area, see if we can get the models to predict what, what might happen and where are our numbers. And this is really important for planning um, city, city, I was talking to a city planner yesterday from San Francisco. I mean, this is incredibly important for us to know. Like, what are we going to be faced with in the future in terms of infrastructure? I actually had the privilege of speaking to the California governor about this a couple of years ago because I was on a sea level report. These are vital numbers that the public want to know and policymakers want to know, and we need to get this, this right. Um, okay, so this is pointing at Thwaites as a real uh, weak underbelly, as we knew from MRSA. Um, and this is great because we just have this new NSF-funded project to, um, to go in there and, and make a lot of measurements. Okay, I can see you're getting up, so it must be <laughs> ending soon. Um, okay, so the choices that we make in this next decade um, will determine which scenario is realized. So we really do need to act very soon. This is from Stefan Ramsdorf, who uh, won an AGU medal last year. Um, really, really great person to follow on Twitter. Um, just, just an awesome climate scientist um, and communicator. Um, so we can actually make a difference if we do something. If we delay, these are the ramifications, and um, we're losing time. Uh, we, we just need to just need to do it. Low emissions are possible. Um, these are some pathways towards that um, that were um, published last year. Um, we do see that sea level rise is um, accelerating. Um, the satellites have shown us that. We know that it's only going in one direction. It's sort of how much, how fast at this point. Um, we know that the mass balance of this is MB2 that Tom Wagner showed. Um, this is basically showing the same thing. We are seeing uh, loss from Antarctica. We know that they're tracking high. The models are providing us really great future um, projections, but actually the models are already tracking higher than that. So we are in um, a real situation that we really need to, to look and uh, uh, work out what's, you know, what does the future hold. This is my final slide. Um, I've put this in because it's a very provocative image that um, I was sent by my brother. Um, my brother's a photographer. Um, and he sent me this, this uh, photograph and it's in an exhibition, was in an exhibition in um, January, I think. Um, in uh, this earlier this year at the Hayward Gallery in London, and this was the image that he showed me. Now I don't know if you can see very well what this is. Um, well, you can see that it's Antarctica, and you can see that it's Lima, but I don't know if you can see the detail that I saw and kind of lost it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Um, but basically, the Amory ice shelf has gone, the front of the Ross ice shelf has gone, has disappeared, and the front of the Filchner-Ronnie ice shelf has also disappeared. So this incredibly um, and he has a lot of followers. Everybody who is in the art world knows Andreas Gursky. He has obviously worked with somebody in glaciology to get this image, and he's got people thinking about Antarctica and what might happen in the future, kind of without knowing it, I think. I don't know. If anybody knows anything about the history of this, this image, I would love if you could come and tell me, and it would also settle a huge debate between my, me and my brother about art versus science. Uh, because I was like, how could you do that to the Amory Ice Shelf? And he's like, well, it did get you thinking, though, didn't it? And he's right. So anyway, that's how I'm going to end. This is what an, in 2070 we might be looking at. Uh, left is the high scenario, and right is the low scenario. That's it. Thanks. Um, we're over time, so uh, I'm just going to, uh, as you filter out, uh, thank the speakers. I'd like to thank the audience, thank the folks on AGU Go. I'd also like to wrap up by thanking the Polar Research Board, including Lauren Everett, who's up front here, Amanda Stout down in the front, and uh, very importantly, uh, thank um, Chris Elfring, who passed away this year, who was a guiding light in the Polar Research Board. Thank you all for your patience, and I hope you learned something today. <laughs>